afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second of our panels for the American Literature Association Conference. Um, today, we'll be continuing our exploration of Olson's understanding of what it means to be outside of the Western box, a term that Sherman Paul discusses in his now indispensable early study of Olson's poetics. Paul writes that, quote, Olson himself went back to the Sumerians and Hittites and outside to the Mayans, thereby escaping the Western box in which he felt Pound was trapped. Our purpose in our panel today is to explore what th this phrase means and has meant for the poetics of projective verse, for American poetry in general, and for ongoing theoretical debate debates about poetics today. And as a final note, uh, I wanna invite everyone to stay on the Zoom call after the question and answer session today. If you're interested in hearing some announcements about the Olson Society's upcoming events and for a social hour. Our first presenter will be Jeffrey Gardner, an independent scholar who has published essays on the poetry and poetics of Charles Olson including Olson's Phenomenology and Olson's Prose, The Mytho and Letters for Olson, and Olson's Poetics and Pedagogy Influences at Black Mountain College and Staying Open, Charles Olson's Sources and Influences. He's also a regular presenter on Olson's work at the Reviewing Black Mountain College Annual Conference at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. He wrote his dissertation on Olson under the guidance of Sherman Paul. He was a Fulbright junior lecturer in Germany. Along with me, she serves as the co-host of the Olson panels at the American Literature Association Annual Conference. Second will be Seth Stewart, who's completed his PhD, uh, who completed his PhD at the Graduate Center uh, of the City University of New York, working on the 20th century New Lyric poet, New American Lyric poet, John Wieners. He currently teaches at the University of Alabama and his publications include The Sea Beneath the House, The Correspondence of John Wieners and Charles Olson, Star Seen in Person, Selected Journals of John Wieners, and then lastly, yours presently, The Selected Letters of John Wieners, which is a great book, really recommend it. Our last presenter will be Luke Franklin, and for our post-conference virtual audience, I should mention that we'll be pausing the video during Luke's presentation as a result of some copyright concerns that we have with YouTube. Luke is a scholar of 20th century English language poetry and poetics, especially modernism. He has an MPhil degree from the University of Cambridge, where he's currently a PhD candidate He's now a faculty fellow at the University of King's College in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, where he teaches in the foundation year program and in the Department of Contemporary Studies. His essay on the annotations Olson wrote in the copy of Ace of Pentacles by John Wieners can be found online in the open source journal Humanities. He's working on a book about Olson's Melville scholarship and what it means to read to write. Okay, and with that, I will let Jeff Gardner take it away. Okay, so, the title of this is actually a little bit slightly off. It's changed a little bit as I continue to work on this, but essentially it still does come back to Olson's sense of the importance of the body and the body is informing so that even when you're looking at archeology, span um, geology, geography, that still are, it comes back to the human body and the experiencing body. So in 1953, Olson uh, organized a series of lectures to address what he at that time called the new sciences of man. And it's a phrase that, that actually, I think he picked up from Carl Sauer. In Sauer's book or essay, The Morphology of Landscape, in a, in a footnote there, he refers to uh, these, what's going on then in, in geography and so on as, as a new science. And, and developments going on there as a new science. And I think Olson may very well have picked up on that phrase from him. Uh, the lecturers then at this, this institute that he put together were Christopher Hawks. And Christopher Hawks had uh, just previous decade had published a book, The Prehistoric, Prehistoric Foundations of Europe. Marie Louisa von Franz, who was a Jungian um, therapist, scholar, writer, and uh, the archeologist, Robert Braidwood. They all, all came to give lectures at Black Mountain. And Olson sort of led into that by delivering a series of essays uh, on Sunday evenings uh, for about a month prior to the, the Institute starting. And then during the Institute, he, he continued to give some lectures. And those are all published in uh, the Olson Journal of the Archive, the Olson Journal Archives, Volume 10, which unfortunately is not in print. And, uh, it really should. It really there's a there's a whole series of other essays that he wrote at that time that some of which were not included in volume ten, and they should be and they should all be brought together. I think at some point 
someone needs to put a collection together of uh, Olson's selected as or Olson's essays during the Black Mountain years because there's quite a bit more information or more there that could be interesting to see or would be interesting to see. So a lot of this talk is actually going to be more reading from slides. So you may read faster than I do, but here we go. So as Olson said in the lectures on the new sciences of man, my joy of the sciences of this institute is this, that it enables any of us to inhabit man in his story backward and forward, as close to exactly as any of us actually inhabit ourselves. And I think that's key because even though this is an institute about sciences, Olson never loses sight of or his concern that these sciences, what do they mean to the learner, to the person engaged with them? And so it does come back to that. And it comes back to how, how we inhabit ourselves, but also how knowledge, how this learning becomes an inhabiting activity for the learner. So in years after the Institute ended, this is in 1955, although it's I find it a little bit odd. It's, uh, it was published at the end of Olson 10, and it's dated May 6, 1955. And it's a very clear uh, bibliography, if you will, of the essays and materials that he was referring to then, but also things that he was recommending to his students. But I actually wonder in some ways, did he type that or did he write it? And if he wrote it, did Butterick perhaps misread the five at the end of 1950? Five, and that it should have actually been 1953. But be that as it may, it may it's a very clear statement of, of the materials that he was referring to and that he was recommending to his students to follow up with. And in that, he, he outlines the four sciences that were his concern in the new sciences of man. And those are geo, geography, geology, bio, biology, archaeo as an archaeology, mytho, mythology. And those are the four terms that he used in that pretty much throughout the, uh, the institute itself, but also in this uh, bibliography that he provided. And Olson, for him, again, these weren't four separate activities. These weren't four separate areas of study. These came back to the person. And this is a statement he made in the mytho. This is again one of those unpublished um, essays from that period of time, comes from the Olson archives. The mytho is the practice of what the bio transmit. The archaeo, which occurs is as lateral, is as literally as the ground, the geo. So for us, and this is what I meant just now, these are not four separate areas of study, areas of research. These are interconnected and they're interconnected in the person involved. So the geo, geo, you cannot use any word without using geography. This is a state, this is a note from a statement that Olson made during his, his last lectures. It's, uh, and I'm not sure that that publication is, is easily available anywhere. I happen to have a photocopy of it. I'm not sure. It was published in 1974 at the University of Iowa. So early on in Sherman Paul's uh, work on Olson, he got a hold of these materials. These were lecture notes that students uh, in Olson's last class in 1969 took. And he, he delivered those lectures at the University of Connecticut. Charles Bohr had invited them there. And this is one of, so these, any quotations from this and any of the material that's there in the last lectures is not Olson's writing. It's, it's students' notes quoting comments that Olson made during that cl those classes. And they ran through November. So he basically concluded those, those lectures about uh, six, five, six weeks before he died. So going back to Sauer and, the, and geology, geography, we are interested in that part of the aerial scene that concerns us. And aerial there meaning just the area, um, physical area of a space, um, it's to physical dimensions. Scene that concerns us as human beings because we are part of it, live with it, are limited by it, and modify it. So you can see in this, this is coming from morphology of landscape, 
why Olson would have been attracted to Sauer. A, a, a statement like that in an essay showing that, again, it's, it's, it's not research that's the research of something out there. It's research that comes in, it becomes internal. And both Olson and Sauer were walkers. And, and I think that probably was also another thing that attracted Olson to Sauer when he found out oh, Sauer retraced Cabeza de Vaca's steps from what's now Florida all the way out to, to New Mexico and so on. And, and as it uh, related in de Vaca's great book, Adventures in the Unknown Interior of America, which I kind of, you know, Snippily think if if uh, Shakespeare's The Tempest had been translated, probably some of the Native Americans, if they heard Devaka say the unknown interior, would have probably said, "Tis new to thee." But anyway, Devaka opened that up. Sauer followed him, took those steps. Olson clearly was influenced by that and, and impressed by it. Was extremely impressed by how what Sauer did in that research. So Sarah also then says, uh, direct influence of environmental stimuli is purely somatic. What happens to man through the influence of his physiological surroundings? So again, Sauer, Sauer is presenting these, these ideas and doing this research. And it's not, I think, what anybody would, would assume a geographer would be doing. That, it's, that, he, that they would be seeing this so intimately connected to the human body, the physical body, and the stimuli being purely somatic, coming from the environment to us through our, our fit, these are our physiological surroundings. And as I, so it's really, it's about how this organic expression of how our senses engage the world. And so it is also, it's, although Olson wasn't using the term proprioceptive yet, you start to get a sense through these texts, these passages, of why he then became in, interested in and open to the notion of the proprioceptive. Because this is that, that sense of the influence coming in the person. So the bio. The bio movement is the issue of the body, is the greatness of physiology, and is, it, and is to it what speech its twin is to whatever else or also a human being is. So that's Olson speaking in the, uh, in the lectures for uh, the New Sciences of Man. To, come, to connect it again back to Sauer. So Sauer wrote, Goethe turned to biologic and geologic studies because he was interested in the nature and limits of cognition. So again, so, and, and Olson then became I think at the time he didn't per se call out Goethe and his influence, but we obviously know that in the 60s he did poetry and truth, but it's also quite evident that he was aware of Goethe's work and was aware of it through, perhaps through Sauer, even perhaps just a few quotations, but it's there. So let's move on from that. So Olson, himself said genetics, now going back to, to this and where biology and the biogenetics is driving physiology, and now going back to physiology, as Sauer mentioned, back in history and out in space. So you can see how, again, these different disciplines, which people too often, I think, see as separate disciplines, Olson didn't see that way. So for him to connect genetics with physiology and history and space is something that probably a geneticist wouldn't necessarily do. It is his own physiology he is forced to arrive at, the animal, man, the house he is, this house that moves, breathes, acts. That's from the essay, The Resistance, which Creeley included in the selected writings. But I included it here just to show, again, that during those, the early 50s, Olson was constantly bringing this back to the animal that we are, that a human is. The writer has been forced, and this is from a, a letter, basically a letter essay that Olson wrote to a, a woman dancer from India. And uh, her name is Vashtai, uh, I can't actually, I'm sorry, I should have wrote, wrote that down, mentioned that. 
But anyway, he writes to her, the writer has been forced today to reawake his attention to the kinetics of words, to the syllables as the eyes and fingers of his medium, to the nouns and verbs as the torso and limbs, to the connectives as the ankles and wrists of speech. So you can see for Olson how the bio again becomes transformative and it becomes kinetic and expresses itself, leads itself to words. But it's also important to see this, that this is the syllabary for a dancer. I don't think enough attention has been given to dance at Black Mountain and Olson's involvement with it and the kind and the influence it had on him. So in the New Sciences, Olson says, dance, drama, who is the medium here? A human body, that physiology. And although he doesn't, uh, in the, those lectures, bring in Jane Harrison in the way that I think he surprisingly didn't, um, Harrison, he certainly he knew Harrison's work and praised it often, but particularly the work, the art, uh, the art of, uh, and sorry, it's her art on the, uh, yeah, I'm drawing a blank, sorry, I will get to it in a minute. But anyway, um, one of the things that, that uh, she wrote that, let me go back to that, sorry. So Harrison wrote that there is no division at first between actors and spectators. All are actors, all are doing the thing done, dancing the dance danced. And Olson surely, surely read that, knew that, and what's interesting there is, again, going back to, to archaeology and archaeological finds and what seems to be evident in cave paintings is that in that sense of what archaeologists discovered was a sense that there really wasn't this, what we have now is you would go to a dance performance and there's dancers and there's spectators. The argument or the presentation here from Harrison is that there was no such division, that it was an activity where all were we're enacting together. So the dance was, was a connective between people. So going to the archaeology, archaeology and the archaeo, uh, a man is his own arche, the arche of his organic being from which he continually creates himself. And all of a sudden, again, in these, these essays, in the essay, The Mytho, which was not published, he cites 19th century archaeological findings, particularly discovery of in 1879 of cave prehistoric paintings. And then for him, he notes the decisive date was Riviere proving in 1895 that these cave paintings were from the Ice Age. They were from the 20th century BC. And Olson relied on a number of, of others, including Frobenius, of course, and one of his key sources, Max Raphael's prehistoric cave paintings, and then Hawks's work and Hawks he brought to, uh, to Black Mountain for those lectures. So among you know, Hawks' statements that, that Olson looked at and quoted from and cited a number of times in some unpublished essays as well. So he said, Hawks writes, he had done with the limits of self-sufficing limb and claw and tooth, he began to use tools. So as if it's the human movement from what the human body had available to the human extension of that and interaction with what's provided in the physical world around the human, and that leading to creation of tools. So Olson, and again, this is an unpublished essay um, to found a science of mythology, clearly related to those lectures of the time. Olson writes, the materials are what the arts are, signs, cups, rings, pictographs, petroglyphs, hieroglyph, cuneiform. So again, an essay where Olson is very much looking at that archeological findings of what it brings forward and what that could possibly mean to him and to poetics. So for him, again, archeology, span it is method, the literal seeking and finding of the objects of man. <clears throat> 
from the new sciences. Cro-Magnon's man's grasp of reality was harsher, fiercer, less narrative, and more image and act in the instant. So these are some of the points that Olson draws out of that. And if you look at the lectures themselves, he spends quite a bit of time of, of really just sort of faithfully dis discussing and describing what were in those works that he was referring to and, and bringing forward. It's not always Olson going off in his own direction, but very much uh, being descriptive of what's there in those texts. So then also again, on things we hone what we are, we also sharpen who we are both by what we do and what we do it on. So again, coming back to tools, coming back to engagement with material, material world. And then later, a decade later, but again, going back to that, this is why I said, I think those lectures that he, he gave during those years were absolutely formative for what Olson did for the next the rest of his writing in life. Words then are naming and logography is writing as though each word is physical and that objects are originally motivated. So you move from that into mythil. And Olson then leading into this, the, uh, the Institute was reading Jung and Karenje's book on the, uh, the science mythology and Karenje wrote there, writes there, mythology has an organic origin. Also in the new science, now also in connecting back, going back to, if you think of uh, Call Me Ishmael and some of what Olson writes there, you get a sense of space and so on, but you get a sense there that, that Olson's study of, of Melville wasn't in, was still, I would say, quite literary. Whereas by now, by the time he moves to the new science as a man and he's opening himself up to these other influences, including the archeological, I think he now starts to see Melville differently as well, or not so much differently, but deep in a deeper way, deeper in terms of how it relates to himself. So he, Melville, comprehended man as mythological in an archeological present. And along with, you know, with, with the reading of Melville, now his reading of the Odyssey and, and how he responded to that. And he's contrasting this here with, with the Iliad, which he saw as being, and so when he talks about, mentions this term historic here, that it was dealing with historic events, but what Olson saw as being more primary was the Odyssey goes to the heart of the mythological. Personages and the events themselves arise not from historic happenings, but from geographical objects. Of course, he has those passages about how, um, well, I'll, 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 I'll pass on that for now, but, but for Olson, again, it's relying on Victor Berard and so on. He's, he's, he's seeing the Odyssey as a late, instance as, as tying back into a much older um, oral tradition. The mythological states reality in exactly those terms by which a human being experiences reality, personages, events, and things. It does not explain, it reenacts. And again, that's, I think, tying in with, with Harrison's comments as well as that of seeing myth and mythology as an activity and not as a kind of objective text out there that's, that's at some distance from, from the reader, the person, but he, he also is seeing this. And you can see why projective verse and why he would take that approach because it, it's, and it's an enactment and it's action, it's physical activity and not in some kind of intellectualized sense of detachment from, from what the material is. So the myth is the re-arising of a primordial reality in narrative form. That narrative itself is the reality which is original, greater, and important now. So this is, I think, really where Olson was, was moving with all of this, with, with, with sciences, sciences that he was bringing in were not so much, as he said at some point, a desire to explain, but to help with the desire to experience. 
and to be able to experience in a different and deeper way. That's, that's, uh, that's wraps up my talk. Thanks everybody. All right, All right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and let Seth take it away next. Uh, thank you, y'all can hear me, right? Um, I'm so glad to never have to really do that much anymore after the age of Zoom, uh, ask if people can hear me. I'm sorry, my power went off during Jeff's presentation. This is starting to storm here. Uh, so I hope it doesn't go off. You didn't again. miss a lot, Seth. I'll figure it. I'll figure no, it I was lot. really everything that you were saying is so in key with what I've been thinking about a lot lately, and so I was really enjoying it. Um, and uh, I have questions for you. But uh, what I was going to talk about today, number one. Okay, let me see. I'm going to I'm going to share screen. Um, uh, okay. Wait, can you guys see my, um, yeah, okay. Let me try doing the present. Uh, isn't it down here? Uh, wait, no, 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 it's up here. Uh, view, present. Is it working? Okay, can you guys see this? Okay, thank you. Um, so I have some slides and I have some notes and uh, I'm gonna see if any of them come together um, in any way. Um, but I proposed, a like y'all, I proposed a topic like what, a year and a half ago, and then was reminded recently of <laughs> what it was. Um, but I wanted to talk specifically, uh, my collection of, of Wiener's letters just came out recently, um, <clears throat> stop. And, um, and I'm really especially struck by this one letter that he wrote uh, from 1957. And I'd like to think about it as sort of a, uh, almost a book report to, to Charles Olson and a statement on uh, methodology, which of course I'm putting a little slash in there because I like thinking about how well Olson's methodology lends itself to amphetamine use. Uh, this is something I've been thinking about half jokingly, but also not at all jokingly, like, like really seriously. Um, John Wieners, for those who don't know, studied with Olson um, in 55 and 56, very much, you know, towards the end. He went on to have this career as a, a very, um, Penny, you gotta stop, a very audaciously queer lyric poet. And, um, and I'm always struck by a lot of times people don't really see him as a true student. And I think through him in this letter, uh, gave me a chance to think not just about him, but about how different students of Olson kind of take his work and his stance, specifically the special view of history material, uh, and take it in their own directions. Um, so in the summer of 1956, uh, Wieners was there for his second non-consecutive turn at Black Mountain. Oh, I included here first his, his letter of applying in, in spring 1955, he had written a letter to the registrar of Black Mountain College uh, saying that he really needs to go so he can be hammering form out of content. Uh, these are, are taken from the, the chat book of Wieners Olson correspondence that I published through the CUNY Center for the Humanities. Uh, after his long letter of application, Olson had written back with a telegram uh, saying we can offer you a loan for this quarter covering tuition, room and board to repayable two years after leaving Black Mountain. Good writing session now going, would be good time for you to come if you can. Call for more details or just come, Charles Olson. And so he did, he went down with his boyfriend for the first of two terms. Um, this is one letter just kind of describing life there, uh, the first term there to an old friend, Robert Green. Uh, and like Jeff, I'm just going to kind of like read from some slides today and talk about some notes in between. Uh, but here he says, the student body numbers at most 15, excellent living conditions, no cubicle, etc., but a wing of a little Dutch house called Mountain Stream with a mountain stream running beside it for 24 hours. Uh, three rooms, a kitchen, a piano, etc. Joe and Carolyn Dunn in one, no one in the other if I can help it. Me in the back under trees with a little screen door and three screened windows, one window with only a screen. I'm not sure what that means. 
Uh, I take theater, lithography, and writing under Olson, who is the only man to have said anything new or fresh about poetry since, well, before Pound, and before Pound, Ernest Fenelosa in his essay, The Chinese Written Character as a Medium of Poetry, and before Fenelosa, John Keats, not in his own poetry, but in his letters, when he attacked Milton and Wordsworth for their egotistical sublime, as he called it, his doctrine was the only new thing said, negative capability, for many, I do not know how many, hundreds of years. Look, read, and read, and try to refute this. Which, I just love this so much, this, um, this ardent student here repeating all of the, you know, you can hear this coming straight from his teacher through him to his friend. Just try and refute this. Uh, this was a year later when he was back there in 56 for his second term. And this was the summer that Olson was, was working through a lot of the special, from what I understand, working through a lot of the special view of history material. And, um, and actually when in, in Wiener's papers at Boston College, uh, among the few things that he saved, uh, one of them is his typewritten set of uh, the notes from Special View of History, which they had all passed around amongst themselves. And, you know, without access to a copier, uh, they each typed their own copy. And so he kept his own copy the rest of his life. So it was a very important material for him. So this is summer of 56 to the same person. Oh, sorry, this storm is getting real. Uh, okay. I take four mornings, four afternoons sometimes, and one evening with Duncan on meaning and content, the poem, and basic technique, the poem, and Rambeau, the illuminations. Also, one morning spent in his reading from the poets, Thomas Hardy, W.C. Williams, and Yeats, so far. Happy to hear you on Apollinaire. Tell me more about Hogue and the others you are doing. Uh, that's a separate thing. And of course, by the time you get this, the session will be ended. Uh, Shaddock's translation I hear of him is quite juiced up, uh, while uh, Madame Varez on Rambaud is quite dried down. I can't get Rambaud's Madame X out of my mind, she who set up her piano in the Alps. I meet with Olson twice a week, one night on manuscripts, I get a poem out a week, and one night on myths and fairy tales. In fact, the teachers have centered for the summer around. Uh, both the teachers have centered for the summer around. In Duncan's today, we read Snow White back to Persephone, Eve, the apple, and Oedipus. He was abandoned, remember, like her, and was ordered put to death like Snow White. Olson read us, is it Alcestis? I'm sorry for the pronunciations I'm going to do today. I apologize. Uh, if you don't remember, we had it, I think, in sophomore Greek. I didn't remember until about 20 lines down in the translation, which is intolerable. For relaxation this week, I made a large three by three collage or montage of Greta, Greta Garbo, great Greta Garbo. I cut out various poses of same and transposed them onto other situations. For example, great Greta Garbo over a gold cross, Greta Garbo on a Grecian column in a wheat field, an exploding atom in a river, etc. cetera. Um, so already in this letter, I see him using a lot of Olson's kind of stance, uh, not just his opinion, but also this, this wide ranging stance of um, what I'm gonna talk about and what y'all know as the, the whole find out for yourself ethos of the special view of history. Um, and for Wieners, this leads him to things like the material he's being assigned, but also um, worship of Greta Garbo. And these are things that are gonna reappear throughout his, his work. Um, Special view of history. I know you guys are all familiar with this, um, but just to, the things that I'm really interested in, uh, you know, notes from Black Mountain 56, an attempt to state a view of reality, which yields a stance nexal to the practice of verse, narrative, and theater now. A course of study which proceeds on the level of history and a concept of man with the dynamic first proposed in projective verse. Uh, he opens with the two um, epigraphs that set the tone, Heraclitus, man is estranged from that which he is most familiar, and Keats's uh, paragraph on the negative, on negative capability uh, from his letters, of course. And Olson, as you know, goes on to talk about these two and how uh, true historians, scholars, people nowadays, in order to become not estranged from what's most familiar to us, what we need is, is less power over in our thinking and more negative capability, more uncertainty. Um, he gives us a stance for how to view history, that it is by inquiry, uh, the knowledge so obtained and the written account of one's inquiries 
um, skipping down. In short, the recognition inquiry picture story that to get the density, what happened, not so easy. Two alternatives, make your own story, fiction or history when you're up against it to equal what went on. Um, which then is why history as the other kind of story that one does also want to know what did happen. I mean, now or just five minutes ago or right now as it is happening, it is a stance. And so this is what I keep coming back to because like when I was thinking about the proposal for this session, I kept thinking like, well, you know, Wiener's read all of this stuff. I've read everything that he read that I could get my hands on. He studied all of the Samuel Noah Kramer, all the Sumerian material, read about the Mayans, all of this stuff, but none of that ever shows up in his poetry. And so I kept asking myself, like, did this material actually affect his imagination? You know, if I'm not seeing this stuff in, in the poetry. And what I realized is that it's the stance that shows up throughout the poetry. It's, it's different objects. Uh, which comes about necessarily because of the stance. Uh, and this is the letter that all of this centers on for me. And I, I put some, a kind of lengthy uh, excerpt here. Just to preface it a little bit, um, this is a, a letter that he wrote when he was in New York. Um, he was on a, uh, a bunch of amphetamines and he went to the public library for the day. And later that day, he came back and Joe Lesur later said that he and Frank O'Hara had gone to see Frankenstein at the multiplex that day. And John Wieners had spent the day at the library. They came home feeling nothing, but Wieners had come home terrified. Uh, and so um, this is, uh, you know, he is doing Olson's meth adology. Uh, September 22nd, 1957, just back from eight hours with near every book Samuel Noah Kramer ever wrote at NY Public Library, except he ain't no Noah. I can't understand why the Sumerians did so little for him that he can impose on them, find us fault, their lack of epistemology, cause and effect, logic. Of course, this is mainly from the tablets of Sumer, and it's a write down. The one done 12 years earlier, which I hope I'll get tomorrow for the texts, translations alone, better. That's the only value of his labor, what he makes available. Not one phrase from the man himself, uh, which is harsh, but eight solid hours is too long to be kept waiting when I should have looked only for their words. I remember some of the loveliest poems being told by you before when Inanna lost it in the garden. The main purpose of this is to serve as cover for the enclosed, which is the prize. They told me you wouldn't have reproductions in the house, but I want you to see this anyway. So lucky to have it at all. The original is possibly a fifth larger. Beside it, the only other one of his I could find, the presentation in the temple. Would you say this is a cappella in the upper left corner of paradise? And he had included a postcard of um, Giovanni de Paolo's, the presentation of Christ in the temple from 1500. I have thought too along the way that Orion Orion is of the secret of secrets. I want you to know this, that whatever I might stumble on shall not be revealed. I agree, you pass it through the work until someone else breaks its surface or through their work into the source. Until then, no one else shall be turned your stars, i.e. per me. And here he's treating Olson's teaching and his poem as um, part of like a mystery tradition. Like you have to be an initiate to be able to get this stuff. And don't worry, I'm not squealing. Uh, he goes on to say, I can find nothing encouraging out about Capricorn and wonder how I should have adopted him. So strong. He's a Capricorn. Only the horn and the blood that breaks through, like Dionysus's. No attention at all to write in Kramer, which is what I want. Dates and objects and how often and many. Like we have it so clear from the Indians, and the little I know. Orion can lead you. I only read number two. Leads you into as much field Capricorn is part of the earthly triad. It is the place of the creation of Saturn with Aquarius. It governs the thighs and knees. This is a quote from a book about UFOs called Other Tongues, Other Flesh, by the way. I would rather be under Aries horn. Oh yes, it is covered wagon. Perseus and mother put into chest and thrown into the sea. The children, Zeus, etc., of Uranus imprisoned in the body of their mother, the earth. That is an actual Kronos reverse apoptastasis. Question mark? Fact, happening. Or am I taking it wrong? That being locked up with them does not prove they are carried in us, except we know they are. I wrote something a long time ago, 12 months, about the way I hold my cigarette like she does. 
so these are a couple of the books that he is he is quoting. I highly recommend Other Tongues, Other Flesh. You can get it for 99 cents on Kindle. It's fantastic. Um, did you know this? This is the last passage from the book I, I want to, I mean, from the letter I want to read. Did you know this? I don't see how so confidently now, but it does bring Pharmacos fool together a little. Hebrews knew him as Kessel, the foolish or self-confident, or as Gibor, the giant, identified with Nimrod and tied to the heavens for impiety. This is again from Other Tongues, Other Flesh. And Peruvians believe a criminal held in by two condors. This morning with the dawn, I went out and began walking up Fifth Avenue from Washington Square where they yelled at me, oh, Hamlet, Ophelia. But I went on, but I went on from one window to the next, passed along till I came to Tiffany's number 727 and they have a relatively small window for jewels, et cetera. Only each one had every detail like an undeveloped negative drops of the Zodiac. It filled six windows. It is simply that I think, a process used on some original map, but I'm going back tomorrow, Monday and try to talk me into one and I will send to you. It, is, it was as laid more than I once out like Roxbury Malden in Earth's, Earth's orbit, ecliptica, and precise drawings of every constellation, the first and second magnitudes carried jewels, well, the first one of any sort of the sky I've ever seen, that the face on the prow of Argos is you, the mouth, no, not so much. Um, so, let me see, I can't remember what I next. Oh, there is just a little bit more. Um, uh, well, he goes on to go into Egypt. I won't read all of this because uh, I could take all day with it, but he goes on to talk about ancient Egypt, Philippine mythology, the Allen symbol, uh, which he's hanging out with someone named Allen. And so that, that goes into a whole other thing. And the letter just ranges all over uh, everything. Uh, he goes on to quote more from other tongues, other flesh. He quotes also from an introduction to a book on Chaucer, but talking about astrology. And then at the end of all of this, he says, but there are leads, I will keep you posted. Um, in the following letter in the book, um, he wrote to uh, Robin Blazer, kind of telling the rest of this story, talking about being like pursued by detectives um, and all the speed that he had been on, all of that kind of stuff. By this time, Wieners had started using uh, amphetamines um, quite a bit. Uh, Michael Rumaker in his wonderful book, uh, Robert Duncan in San Francisco, talks about Wieners introducing him to amphetamines and laying out the benzedrine like a cross uh, and, and getting him to take it as a sacrament. Uh, and so what we see in this letter, what I see in this letter is the thrill of um, what's called apophenia. I've been thinking a lot about apophenia recently. Uh, the term was coined by the psychiatrist Klaus Conrad in his 1958 book on schizophrenia. He defined apophenia as an unmotivated seeing of connections accompanied by a specific feeling of abnormal meaningfulness. So he sees it as a symptom of, of, of um, schizophrenia coming on uh, but I want to suggest it's also uh, a way of thinking about the chasing down every uh, thread that you can and seeing where it goes, uh, finding out for yourself. It's just that Wieners is getting a real thrill from it. And so, you know, my question is where he goes from there, because after this letter, he gets to San Francisco. When he's there, he writes his first book of poems in June of 1958, Hotel Wentley Poems. He writes them just in like one, a little over one week in this rundown hotel in Polk Gulch. I've been talking to an astrologer to try to find out what was going on astrologically that week. I feel like it's a, I have to in tribute to that letter. Um, and, you know, he doesn't, as I said, he doesn't revisit Olson's objects in his poems. To my knowledge, he never really talks about Sumerian or Mayan stories in his work, but he does always conjure the ancient past. He always mixes it, mixes it in with some archaic language, some 30s popular music. He continues to examine astrology and magic, um, the occult. Uh, I'm happy to see Luke Franklin here. I loved his piece on Ace of Pentacles, which is of course named after one of the tarot cards. And in his letters around that book, Wieners is obsessed with the numerology of it and the penta 
of the pentacles. And he continues to be obsessed with a lot of the things that we see in that letter. For example, his reading Noah Kramer and getting repeatedly incredibly frustrated by the lack of attention to ritual. I think that's something that he gets from Olson and from Jane Harrison, right? Uh, like, but what were they doing? What were they doing when they were talking about all this stuff? Uh, and he continues to be obsessed with rituals and rites. How are things done? This is an excerpt from his poem for Vipers in 58. I sit in Lee's at 11.40 PM with Jimmy the Pusher. He teaches me juju. Hot on the table before us, shrimp foo young, rice and mushroom chow yuk. Up the street under the heels of a strange car is his stash, the ritual. We make it and have made it for months now together after midnight. Soon I know the fuzz will interrupt, will arrest Jimmy and I shall be placed on probation. The poem does not lie to us. We lie under its law, alive in the glamor of this hour. And so he's, he's documenting the, the rituals and the magic of the world he sees all around him. In another poem from 57 that he sends to Michael Rumaker, it's called, Oh, Listen to My Words for I Am Wise. He has this wonderful little part where he says, there are magic happenings going on all over the world. I pick up an ashtray and it has the hair of Jean Harlow in it. And I'm really struck by that moment of a, a goddess manifesting in his world there. Uh, for him, the goddesses aren't Inanna and Tiamat. They are Greta Garbo and Jean Harlow. Now, uh, and so this is all about the difference between stance and um, objects, really. Because if you follow Olson's stance and follow the path that he lays out in the special view of history, it is inevitably going to lead you to your own objects, which is why I think, uh, you know, I love so much reading the, the very different um, objects and worlds of these different Black Mountain poets is because that is what his, his methodology leads to inevitably. And he writes in a letter to Robert Duncan a couple of months before the library letter, he says, your statement on the personal, ever since first quoted to me by Robin Blazer, has of course been a thing in my mind. Also, I remember now at Black Mountain, poetry is not a statement of or expression of the self, but a participation in, is this right? The or a created world? Now, this is harder on me because I carry the personal so around with me, not any longer the love burden. I wrote Olson tonight, there's a larger desire to participate in, but there was nothing I could do about same until it had removed itself, this immediate desire. But I still have the personal, the personae. So he's like, he's not wanting to be a confessional poet, right? He's wanting to be a projective poet. He's wanting to do the special view of like the world. So he goes on to say that I believe and must state it somehow, the objects of my world, the belly grinders, et cetera, compulse me to write of them that we only have our own eyes, what their structure forces them to see, how some lights are shut out. This all ties in with me as editor because I cannot afford any partial vision, any personal one. And thus yours against Spicer, I believe in because I have seen it in action. Know the, can I call it evil source, the misery it feeds on, how it creates the situation to feed on, how it becomes homeless without same. And then it comes down to nothing more than ego or self and exploiting of same. Beat your own drum, et cetera. And if your own sounds hollow, then find a head to beat, a heart. And just in brief, what he's railing against Spicer for here is his abandonment of negative capability. He sees Spicer as being a classic example of um, the egotistical sublime. Now, he's so he's stressing out about how do I find my objects? I just want to write about things like belly grinders. This is the wonderful response from Duncan, one part of it. He says, I'd say wieners keep the objects of your world. Just look them straight on. Belly grinders, when all is in focus, is as real as trees. This focus, a turning between subject and object, right declaration of where and when, exact placing and timing, needs more practice with belly grinders than trees. What I sense as needed in your work is some not making too much of a good thing, even perhaps an artificial impoverishment of wit. Your mind is so ready with material to begin with. So in other words, keep focusing on those objects. It's just all about how you talk about them. And the way he talks about these objects always carries with it the whiff of the archaic for me. And I wanna conclude with one of my favorite poems by him that doesn't get enough discussion, I don't think. 
he wrote this poem about a good friend of his who was a burlesque dancer, Jan Mintz. And I have a whole bunch of research on her in the book. She's a fascinating figure. Um, and so he wrote this poem about her that I just want you to see how he's writing about his lived world of like, you know, junkies and, and burlesque dancers and, and street folks. Uh, but he does it always with a, a whiff of the archaic, a, a, a wafting of, of, of the old and magic coming in that I think he takes from his days at Black Mountain. For Jan, the girl hustles her islands of pure flesh. There is no way to redeem her loss but words where the ecstasy awaits at the fringe of our lips. There in the night she sells her body to old China for the dreams all men carry in their loins. Offend not the ancestral gods by this sale of love or tasting of unknown secret pleasures always been our due to inhabit at the riverbank the depth of ocean in midstream. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Seth. That was great. Good, good. Well done. Um, okay. Uh, and then so our last presenter today will be Luke Franklin. So Luke, why don't you take it away? Okay, and I'm, I'm going to switch back to gallery view here. Um, so I guess we have some time for, uh, for Q&A. Uh, we have a short bit of time for Q&A questions. Any questions people have or um, for the thoughts or speculations? Um, some fascinating, fascinating presentations and really fascinating material all around. So I don't know. Does anyone, does anyone like to start us off? I just want to say I loved all three presentations today. What, what, a, what a great afternoon this was. R really, thank you all. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree, Joe. That was really, that was really good. Um, I don't know, anybody? I, I had a couple of things that just came up. Um, I wanted to ask Jeff, if I'm not mistaken, I think I read this in Butterick just a, a little while ago, um, the New Sciences of Man lectures at Black Mountain immediately preceded the first Maximus poems, right? And 1953, spring 53, he, he had written the first couple uh, a few years earlier, mm -hmm. but the, the Maximus poems as a unit started right after these lectures, right? I, I Actually, no, actually, you know, Joe, I didn't know that. That's interesting to hear because I think that that makes, makes sense, doesn't it? Because he comes out of that with, I think, a different sense of place than what's evident in his earlier poems. So that would make sense. I, I didn't know that though. I'll, I'll take a look at that in, in Buttering. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, sorry, I, I think that's right. I think there's a, I think right, right after like the summer of 1953, there's like an, like a, an avalanche, right? Of, of several Maximus poems um, that get written. If, I mean, I'm looking at my Butterick, right? And one of the advantages maybe here is that we can grab books off my shelf to look at. Um, but I think, I think Joe's right about that, that a number of, of the poems kind of come out of those, out of those lectures. I mean, I also thought it was interesting what Jeff was saying that um, these were the thoughts that led to proprioception. They weren't proprioception, yes, but you know, you could see you could see it. Uh, yeah, you can. Right. Absolutely. You know, the other thing that's interesting, and, and I think where that connects to what you just showed us, Luke, is that you know, the, the, I think the people who who tend to criticize Olson or um, look down a bit on projective verse and so on and the use of the typewriter and all that is how little attention has been given to how much handwritten poetry Olson did. The writing of it, the physicality of those poems is, re is really quite striking when you show that. And I think that actually in, in fits more into what he was thinking about and doing in 53 than any sense of using a typewriter. To, to sort of score out the breath, breath pattern of a poem. It was very interesting for me to see those, those handwritten, um, those texts that way. It just gives a whole different physicality to it than what you can get out of a printed page. 
Yeah, I would agree. And uh, so much of the interest, I think, is in the work of translating the handwriting into an adequate typographical translation, Excellent. if it may speak sense to, uh, to speak that way. Um, yeah, no, no, I, I think that's definitely true. Um, I mean, I've, I've worked with some of Olson's, a lot of Olson's annotations as well in, in Whitehead and it's another one of these books that he was constantly marking up um, to the point where if you look at the flyleaf, you can't even read any of it. I mean, it, it looks almost like some kind of like, you know, um, some kind of art historical object or something like that. Um, but I think I, what I had for Luke, I think I had a question for Luke actually that, that maybe fits in here too, a little bit about just um, about how we read Olson and how, and, and how to investigate Olson. And, and it has to do with this notion of, of like reading and writing and writing while you read and, and annotation and using marginalia as a kind of creative space. Um, and so like, as you were talking, I, I was kind of, you know, I thought that like, you know, for me, the way that, the way to kind of like understand Olson or to read into his poetry is, is really what you were doing, which is to kind of look at those annotations, to look at his library, to look at his creative process. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could say more about that, Luke, like just from a, just from kind of a larger standpoint, like the, of the work you're doing with his Melville stuff. And maybe you just talk about how you're theorizing kind of like the role of the creative process in, in terms of its relationship to reading and writing um, in Olson. Because again, I mean, for me, it's always unlocked like kind of incredible sort of ways of looking at the poetry so that like whole vocabularies can come out of Whitehead. And so like when I read Maximus three, whenever I see the word strain or measure or event or impetus or variety, words that don't even seem important, right? It, maybe even in Butterick, but they're very important as annotations of Whitehead, like they help me to read the poems. So I don't know, I don't know if you wanna say more about that, about the work you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I can really hear where you're coming from with the uh, terminology he adapts from Whitehead. Um, it's hard to summarize the Melville stuff all at once right now. But when I was making this, this particular paper, what jumped out at me was simply the fact that Olson's most often used sources, probably not Whitehead and Jung and his favorite writers, but this battery of dictionaries and reference tools he had at his disposal all the time. So there's a way in which Olson treats every single word of every poem that he writes as though it were a, uh, an article of specialized terminology. <laughs> so uh, in a sense, okay, there's uh, Olson. Olson um, understands how Melville did his work and how Melville used his books. Uh, on the other hand, there's also uh, an exit out of that world of uh, private uh, operations on literary sources into something more public, which is simply the, uh, the materials of which words are made and which anyone can find out for themselves by just looking at any reference tools or just you know paying attention to the components, the sublexical elements of which words are made. Thank you, thank you, That's, thank you very much for that, that's good. Jeremy Prynne does a lot of that, I think, in some books. I wanted to ask Luke if he was aware that um, Ed Dorn mentioned the Scald as well in the book of uh, uh, short prose that he wrote called Some Business Recently Transacted in the White World. The very first oh, wow. story of that mentions the Scald and, and his respect for Olson. Uh, no, no, I'm just kind of just beginning to, uh, to read Dorn carefully. So uh, thanks for the reference. And I'm really looking forward to reading that particular title. Um, and and I, feel, I feel like I want to ask you a question about Dorn right now that I have the opportunity. Um, <laughs> <'cause> like, <laughs> can, can you give an, imp I, I've read your essay, right? Um, on the uh, on the Buffalo uh, website, maybe can you can you speak uh, to the relation of uh, of Dorn to Olson? Um, um, <laughs> probably probably not in any um, depth, but um, I, I 
I've written quite a few essays about both of them, so I'm not quite sure what you're referring to, but right. I, can, I, I can tell you, I can tell you this. Um, whenever Olson's name came up in conversation, Ed was very careful to point out that Olson was his teacher. He wasn't a friend. I mean, he really, he he really emphasized that more than once to to me and to the other students that were there. He 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 wanted to keep a certain distance, you, you know. Uh, yeah. it wasn't just like buddy buddy, you know. Mm -hmm. So. Hmm. All right. Uh, but there's a lot. There's a lot to say about that, Luke. Maybe email or something. <laughs> yes, and I will look up those other papers of yours. Yeah. Um, I had one thing I wanted to kind of bring up in regards to Luke's paper. Um, there was this point in that really interesting intervention you were making with the Ginsburg piece early on with uh, local records where you, I think you say in a kind of offhand way, you say something like shuffling through the records for its own sake. Did, did I hear you correct on that? Is that, some, is that like, like th that there was some sort of like uh, idea of maybe diminished returns, um, that maybe this wasn't the most efficacious process, like digging around in these records <laughs> to figure out, is that, is, was, that, was that the kind of imposition that you were making? Cause I'm curious about that. And, 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 I, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that. Is that, was that kind of, I, was I miss, listen, did, was it, did, do I mishear you on that or? No, I mean, that is not my impression of what Olson is doing. I mean- But I, that was Ginsburg, this is what I'm trying to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I love the fact that he's uh, uprooting all of this material and, and I find the more obscure the, uh, the, uh, the, the articles of property that make their way into the Maximus poems, the more uh, weirdly interesting. Yeah, well, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, there was no value judgment there. I was just trying to make, make sense of it because it seems like something like that act of like shuffling around in the words that yeah. seemed like something connected in with that image of wieners at the library going through this material, it having a kind of research for its own sake kind of aspect to it. Um, and, and then that kind of brought me back when you were talking about Olson's interest in etymology and in you know reference volumes the letter to elaine feinstein when he says there um it's that the second advantage of speech is that you can track any word practically back along to find its force to anglo-saxon latin greek but he says it and he goes that it's a non-commercial non and non-historical non-historical constant daily experience of tracking any word. I've always been curious about that, or not always, but recently, uh, non-literate, non-commercial practice of tracking these words back. That like, that this act, like that seeing this in some relationship to some sherry values of efficiency and productivity, that it somehow sits outside or analogous to that. Um, you know, I'm interested in that. I don't know if any of that produces anything like a thought-provoking question, but it is a series of connections that I was tracing out. And I think it kind of comes back to that question of the value of the skull, of the appropriation. Um, I don't know if, if that has any, if that's generative for you in, in, in thinking. Yeah, uh, wow, you said so much. Um, I, I suspect at the beginning, um, I'm uh, suggesting my own intuition that Ginsburg may have felt he had to apologize for Olson, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I might be wrong. Some of you who, who are poets may have a greater ear for nuance in what Ginsburg was saying, but it, it can't help but suspect that Ginsburg uh, felt that he, need to, he needed to apologize for what he thought Olson was doing with all these dusty old records and he needed to, uh, he needed to let uh, possible leaders of Olson know that in fact he was uh, doing all this for the sake of uh, a higher, nobler purpose, which is revealing the details of expropriation. Uh, but 
I mean, in some ways, I think Olson was uh, willing to let himself get lost in materials without any clear mm-hmm. idea of what the payoff might be or what what the objective at the end uh, was going to uh, seem to appear as. So non-commercial, just as you say. Yeah, I think I think that's a really interesting um, comment, Pete. Just that the the sense of it being non-commercial, like you can't sell this stuff, right? Like how could you, how could you, you know, package right something like all of those annotations in Whitehead? I mean, I've had, obviously had this thought before and presented to the public and like try to make a monetary gain off of it. It's like nobody's going to buy this thing, you know. Um, but I think Seth's presentation, I thought, really had you know i love that sense set that you had of apophenia right for that that like this this pursuit mm-hmm. right of connections and of and of and of the way that texts and words and concepts kind of like uh fall together or get connected in odd ways by the imagination it produces a kind of ecstasy right that that i mean at least if, if i heard you correctly that's kind of what you're talking about with Wieners in the library, right? Is that is that there was something sort of um, almost ecstatic, right, or, or very pleasurable about this activity, um, as and it and it does seem to be, you know, non-commercial, right? Like he doesn't go to the movies; um, he goes to the library instead to look at to look at tablets and everything like that. So I, I love that that thought, you know, just that, and I guess it's more of a comment, you know, than anything, but just that there's something about that kind of pursuit, you know, that libraries are a place where you can, where you can pursue this kind of stuff, you know, um, so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing that kind of comes to mind in Seth's talk, I, I kept trying to work out the relationship of glamour and grammar, right, like that etymological link um, that's <laughs> playing out there, like this excess of annotations that's surrounding the page, um, the kind of, the, the, the occult practices, the kind of link between grammar and the occult. Um, it seems like there's something there between glamour and grammar. Uh, it seems that I'm not gonna be thinking about much else besides that uh, for, for the next little bit. <laughs> uh, that's, that's wonderful. And with, with grammar being like the, an un, the underlying structure of language and glamour being like the <laughs> underlying structure of art for me, um, you know, I love that. And glamour being a spell that you fall under, you're put under a glamour. Um, uh, yeah, I love that. Thank you. Um, and magic things to, like the the connections and weird coincidences, and you know, like one way to read that letter when he's talking about the cops and stuff too is that he's being paranoid but also that he was a gay drug user. So he really was being followed, you know, all the time. And so it wasn't, it's not paranoia if, if they're out to get you. And also if magic happenings are really happening all over the world, you are not imagining magic gatherings happening all over the world. Um, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like with this <laughs> conference, immediately before our talk, I get an email from that student who's at the campus of Black Mountain. Immediately afterwards, an alert popped up on my phone. I'm sorry to admit that I checked it, I'm weak. But it was from, (laughs) I had just finished reading that poem and talking about Jan Mintz, who was my favorite figure. I got this message from someone I've never met saying, hey, Jan Mintz is my grandmother and I read your thing on her and she really was awesome. And I'd love to talk to you sometime. Do you have time? Um, (laughs) That's great. Like magic (laughs) happenings are occurring all over the world. So it's all true. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of the Rumerker Duncan book that you referenced. I think there's something in there where he quotes Duncan as saying, I don't know if it's him distinguishing himself from Olson or what, I don't know what context, but there, I, it always came to me as like this kind of definitional statement about Duncan and saying, well, I, I crave glamor. Um, mm-hmm. That there's this, that there's a, 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 an essence about that, that there's, and you know, so they're all kind of thinking that, you know, like around there at that time. So it's, it seems like a collective concern, really interesting. Mm-hmm. Seth, do you, do you know, if um, Wieners kept a, a negative 
attitude about Spicer for a long time or was it just then? I don't, I just, I don't think they ever really liked each other. Uh, huh. Spicer made several derogatory comments um, and about him and, and, and like about his magazine measure uh, and Wieners would, would express things about, you know, he'd read Spicer and be like, he's not doing anything with the line. Uh, he's not doing anything interesting with the line and it's all egotistical. Uh, and, you know, and so I think there was a kind of a lifelong, but also respect, but also antipathy. Uh, so. Hmm. Well, they both were in Boston and San Francisco, right? Like, so I'm, I'm, did he, I'm wondering if you had contact with them in both places. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They, he got to know them, him in Boston during that first period when um, Spicer was there with Blazer and everybody. And then later would go around to the place, uh, of course, the bar in San Francisco and was part of that same thing. But then, you know, Wieners was hanging out with like Joe and Carolyn Dunn and the other kind of like drug users and Spicer had no use for them. Uh, and they're all writing about magic, but from very different perspectives. Uh, it, it's really interesting. Like I think Spicer, for Spicer magic is a metaphor and for, for Wieners, it, it's, it's a, an old mystery tradition. Like, he, you know, like I, I just think, so it's interesting the two of them are, uh, weird twins in a way. Um, okay, so is that, I think that's probably, does anybody have any final questions or uh, final thoughts by any chance before we, before we conclude? Pleasure. This is exactly as big a Zoom meeting should be, you know, no, no more than this, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Okay, so well, then that will conclude the uh, the ALA's uh, virtual presentations for the Charles Olson Society, and I.